There is one difficulty in the world at the moment, amongst many that we continually hear about and talk about, and that is the issue of the supply chain. Now, with the holiday season approaching fast, the ability to send things, whether by boat or plane or train or truck, is going to become ever more sorry, important. Sorry for being that. I'm going to say hi. No, no, no. Wait here. And the difficulties Wait. of a supply chain issues become ever more present. But what do we actually mean when this? Well, our next three guests are going to put this into perfect perspective. They are designed specifically to show the three different areas of the supply chain. Fernando, first of all, the CEO of Minerva Foods. Fernando, come on out, please. If you take the far seat and, oh, good Lord. Also joining us is Amit Mitra from Elat and Hanadi, the chair of Agility. Please take your seats. Right. We begin, I, I, the three of you are good examples. I can't see you, so I'm going to move this chair like this so I can see you there, much better. That's given the organizers a conniption fit. Um, the supply chain, look, I'm weary of hearing about supply chain issues. I feel I've been hearing them, and I feel you've been using them as an excuse for poor performance in some shape or form for a great deal of time. I'm being provocative because you're a freight forwarder. <laughs> to a certain extent, yes, but you should be provocative. What's the problem? There is no problem. Oh, good. <laughs> What is the issue you know, at mean, the moment I, with supply chain issues? I mean, fundamentally, if you look at the past several years and the level of disruption that's been taking place in the system, inherently, you have a supply chain disruption taking place every 3.7 years. And that fundamentally impacts the profitability of companies. So within a span of 10 years, any company can witness a 40% decline in their profit in one year because of supply chain disruption if they're not prepared. All right. I have a point of view. Oh, that was quick. I think, I think we saw for the last 20, 30 years supply chain for efficiency. We thought the world was flat, the globalization was unabated. We did not solve for resilience. We did not solve for sustainability. We did not solve for digitization, what you need to do. Did we not solve it because we didn't realize it was a problem or we just ignored it? Were we ignorant or stupid? Well, in hindsight, 2020, you can always say, I should have known this, I should have done this. But I have been on the commercial side where we did manage, we were the best in supply chain. And I can tell you, the constraints we're putting on supply chain are quite different. Being it, where can you take the factories to? Where should supply chain be? What is the definition of resilience versus efficiency? All of that is new. So the, the commercial players are responding. Of course, external events, whether it's geopolitical tensions or wars or, or pandemic doesn't help, but that's where it's getting tested. So of course, it takes time to come to new reality. And I think uh, you are right on the geopolitics is a very important issue because uh, the more polarized that the world becomes, the less uh, you have a free trade, the more that you trade with blocks that are aligned with you. So it's a, not a matter of, uh, of uh, near shoring, but a trust shoring. What are the blocks that are formed and that, uh, how this impacts uh, the, the world supply chain, especially on food? So we're going to dissect this bit by bit because you have the practical problems and you have the geopolitical problems, which are practical problems, I understand that. And then we have the solutions that are coming forward. But humor me a second. Essentially, you've got this. Goods are manufactured here, all right? They then have to be taken here. They then have to be taken here, and then they have to be sold to you, basically. And at each point in this chain, there seems to be supply chain issues. So the manufacturer has supply chain issues getting the goods in. There are supply chain issues getting here, there, and then finally to you to deliver to the front. Do we agree on that? We do. Definitely. But, but there is a reason for that, why that is the case. And so if you're trying to look for a solution, 
the description always saying why it is so. Today, manufacturing is a game of scale and specialization. You focus on one process and you scale it up. So a chip that shows up in your smartphone may require 50 to 60 times handover between multiple players from the ingot all the way to sort of final deployment. And that is because these machineries are so advanced and so expensive, you really can't do it all. You have to be dependent on one another for supply chain. But I go into that. Uh, there are two things that are important to make uh, this chain more efficient. Is where is the real vocation of each country? What uh, each region can uh, really produce in a competitive and an affordable way for the final consumer? This is uh, one point. And give me an example. I give an example uh, uh, on the food. You need the natural resources like water. And uh, they are available in some, certain parts of the world. In South America is an example. And the consumption is much more on the Far East, in the Northern Hemisphere, that they don't have uh, the amount of uh, natural resources that are needed to be inefficient. Or if they uh, try to replicate that, sustainability issues becomes a big problem. So, and, and, and let me add on to that. So, the new reality also says, where is the demand, where is the supply? Where is the sun is shining and where is the energy demand? And you need the grid and microgrids and everything else around it. So again, realities are changing, expectations But it changing. didn't happen overnight, did it? No, definitely not. That. So just going back to one of your points, when it comes to forwarders and supply chain providers, you know, at the end of the day, we are following our customers. We're here to serve the customers. And bottom line, we've been investing in technologies all throughout, focus on agility, diversification, and also to enhance the visibility. Visibility and automation have been in the system a long while back. It's not just, but it's just more salient now in order to implement and to connect to the ultimate customer in which we're here to serve them. I, I, I think that's a good point, because if when the COVID hit, pandemic hit, it wasn't the most expensive part that broke the supply chain. It was the cheapest part that you said, it's so basic, it will always be available. Some of the display, right. the TVs had a display, display device, the, the driver, the, that was the biggest 99 cents part, broke the supply chain. So now, you, when you solve for resilience, you, don't, you, you solve for that as well. So we'd had decades of being told just in time supply chain, don't hold up huge amounts, get your suppliers in place, keep your suppliers in place. But now we are rethinking it from the bottom up, in essentially. Aren't For resilience, yes. Yep. What does that mean? What I mean, bottom line, you're thinking about resilience, you're thinking about diversification. And yes, diversification does come at the cost of price. I mean, that's, that's definitely known. But if you apply technology to that, technology anywhere from visibility to tracking to AI, and you couple that, you're able to increase your revenues by 3% during a shock. So what does resilient, let's take diversification, then let's do diversification, resilience, and then we'll do geopolitical. How do you diversify? Diversification by diversifying your suppliers. 70% of companies in the past two years have diversified their suppliers all throughout the world. That's whether it's nearshoring, friendshoring, thinking about connector countries, or thinking about neutral countries. And as yesterday they said, a country like Saudi Arabia, which is now a super connector country. So, your, think, com think. your company is designed as part of Vision 2030. That's correct. You're a fundamental part of the new of job creation, et cetera, et cetera. But you're taking advantage of this current situation because you can manufacture things here that might have been done in China or other countries less uh, favorable. Our mandate is to build a global supply chain node for world-class companies to be in Saudi Arabia. Doing that will bring IP, R&D, jobs of the future, and also make kingdom more resilient. So it's all together. Now, Does it you, make sense to build it here? Sustainability is also a key part. Look at the previous panel, talked all about energy infrastructure as a gap. Kingdom is investing $286 billion by 2030, investing $147 billion in transportation and logistics. Future of the manufacturing with sustainability, with resilience, is right here in Kingdom. I mean, you talk about it just recently, but we've been investing in Saudi Arabia for over 20 years, and we've been investing in infrastructure and real estate and warehousing to enable 
logistics all around the world. So it's not new. Saudi Arabia plays a fundamental part within the global transportation system. Our main goal is to make uh, food affordable. Right. Therefore, what are the key and vital points for us? Is to identify what are the parts of the world that uh, we can do it, do it in the most efficient way, and also transport in a very uh, efficient and sustainable way. So this is part of our goal on how uh, to have resilience and how to achieve our objectives. N near shoring has become the, the or friend shoring, getting your supplier in a politically friendly country, is I think the best way to describe it. Yeah, I mean. It's oh, don't worry, break a few eggs. <laughs> but, but no. yeah, I mean, listen, you see this happening all over the place. You, have, you see new logistics hubs emerging, you know, the likes of uh, Mexico, Vietnam, Indonesia. But you also see countries trading further distances, for example, Brazil and China. Right, but let's say, and I'm aware that a few more eggs are about to be broken, let's say we're talking about a US-China relationship that is deteriorating, and therefore you want to beef up your supply chain, so you create a distribution via Mexico. Is That's one of the, the new ones, isn't it? But, Chinese investments. But I think it's different than that. I think we're, we, before we even bring it everything down to trade war, I would paint a different picture of retooling and new realities of supply chain. You have energy transition that requires 100 trillion to 200 trillion, I, I'm, I'm not mistaken, to by 2050, we're only 10% there. So energy is a big thing. Semiconductor will require within one nanometer and beyond with quantum computing several trillion dollars of investments. If you look at the data center infrastructure, that requires several trillion. My point is, in this case, you have to know where your data is secure, where infrastructure is trustworthy, and you have to solve for the new reality where sustainability is core, technology... Well, hang on, you're jumping it. around here. Yeah? Jumping around between... Tell me. Well, between delivering fruit around, or vegetables okay, so around back to the fruit. world to data centers, to, to manufacturing chips, yeah. to, to, to actually shipping with them. What is the common thread? Common thread is you can't do it alone. You need trusted partners as a company, as countries, as individuals. Stop there. And, and you need uh, risk uh, management uh, policies. Yep, we'll come to that in a second. You, of that phrase, you need trusted partners. Which is the most important word? Trust, Trust. and partner. <laughs> <laughs> If I give you a choice of trusted or partner, you're going to go with trusted. Partner always has to deliver trust. You cannot partner with somebody if they are not trustworthy. So if I have to pick the word, I would pick partner. At the end of the day, when you're talking about trust and partnership, especially in supply chain, it's really a bottom line, it's reliability. Can you serve my needs irrespective of what tariff comes up, irrespective of what change takes place? And this is where technology, resilience, and diversification plays the biggest role. And this is where you see companies and forwarders doubling, doubling down on. And hence, you know, the investments that are taking place in Saudi Arabia, you know, China's investing a trillion dollars in the One Belt, One Road. You have Mexico investing in, in a potentially new interconnecting canal. I mean, these are the things that your partner has to be aware of, know, and double down on in order to create that sustainability for their customers. And the markets are changing. The markets are new markets. Giving an example, Brazil today, today trades more with Bangladesh than with a traditional pattern like Italy, right? So it's a new the discover. We have to invest right. on the relations and on the trust. Yeah, and, and let me add on to that. You say in two months, one month, OpenAI was 100 million users, 200 million users. The energy requirement is 9x of any simple search for every query you put on it. But to have the industrial energy infrastructure to support that, take years. See, this is the mismatch. The demand goes faster. The built out of capability to support that will take time. Energy transition and energy infrastructure is one of the things we are focused on. Right, so you're doing a very good advert for yourself. Yeah. I, I get it. Yeah. The, I want to come back to this question of trusted. And the reason I'm going to focus on it is because prior to the pandemic, 
none of us had we'd thought about these issues. And I suppose people like yourself had had a few sleepless nights thinking this could all go horribly wrong at some point in the future because of you know the, the fragility of, uh, of supply chain. But you gave me a really good example back there of the the nature of the political issue here. Tell me again about who trades with who. And this is a very important issue when it comes to the trust uh, sharing. Uh, political al alignment opens doors or closes doors uh, for countries. So the best way, if a company wants to be global, is to have uh, the geographic diversification where you can hedge yourselves on being in different countries with different ide ideologies uh, by trading with uh, different countries that are aligned with uh, these uh, yeah, ideologies. Such as? I give you an example of Argentina. Argentina was in a left uh, side uh, government uh, with certain partners, and now Argentina moved it to the right side. So it's a new partners and new agreements that Argentina has. And then suddenly, of course, you've all got to be careful of uh, any sanctions regime. Sanctions, and the orig sanctions regime. Tariffs, quotas that comes from either third countries or countries of origin issues. Now, this is meat and veg to you on a daily basis, isn't it? You deal with these issues. No, of course. And then I come back to this question that you keep on bringing up is trust. I mean, at the end of the day, politics and policy will always change. Fundamentally, you need boots on the ground to actually understand what are these changes, what are these dynamics, and where can I drive that visibility? And this is where... And that's pretty much our job over here, is to make sure we provide that and at the end of the day provide you know, reliability to the consumer. How difficult is it for you as freight forwarders? Somebody wants to ship something from A to B, but it started at Z, it's got components from X, Y and B, and, no, and you've got to work out, oh hang on a second, that's for origin of issue there, and that's going to there, and we can't send it there because that's sanctioned from the US, and that's it. How difficult does it become? Listen, if you would have asked us 20 years ago, I would have said it's very difficult, and we've been on the phone. But now with technology, visibility, IoT, you know, I look at, for example, we've invested in custom, digitizing custom clearance, and we worked with a contract with Kuwait. We pretty much digitize all their custom clearance, and we're able to clear goods faster four times. We're, we're also able to take out 19 million sheets of paper a year out of the system to drive that visibility. So today, if you ask me how easy it, to, easy, easy it is, it's much easier than it was 20 years ago. So this, that is, and that is core, because that goes, that, that survives forever. But let's stay with this political question. So, so, so I think the, the supply chain and all functions in any world-class company is optimized to achieve a purpose. We were solving for efficiency. That means you never said, don't give me more than X percent of my supply chain coming from single country because tomorrow I may have to retool this or make sure no vendor is more than X, Y, Z percent. I still know many companies that have more than 60 percent of their supply chain originating from one single country. In the resilience model, the new one that we're building, Will, will be solved differently. But I will build on her point, which is that today, complexity is so high, yet AI is to the rescue. Without AI running and coordinating and optimizing and making sure we solve for resilience, you really won't be able to operate supply chain where thousands of parts, thousands of suppliers, logistics providers, and so on and so forth. Sounds great. Excellent, good. Brilliant. Uh, can we stop here now? No. <laughs> Because let's throw in the political dimension. Suddenly, the US says, um, I'm sorry, you've got some chips or you've got some technology, Mr. Sa Mrs. Saudi, that you're selling. Uh, we're not very happy about it. We require you to stop selling those because it could get back to the Chinese. Now, there have been examples of this. You're well familiar with it, where the US has has, my words, not yours, imposed a regime of, of, of restrictions and you're put in the position of either following or not. So I'm not the you, right person, you, I'm not the right person to speak on this, but what I can say is this. A lot is mandated to build world-class companies here with sustainability at its core and making sure that we are compliant with all rules and laws. 
I would say that, as I said before, trusted partnership. We want to be trusted partners. By whom? I'm sorry? That's the point. Trusted by whom? Trusted partner to our, we are, comp we are partnering with the global companies. We want to make sure the commitments we make to them, we comply with all the rules, and we fulfill our mandate, which is to build the industry here. And I agree that the decision on trusted by whom is one that has made many we, levels higher than me. Right. And it is, again, we, we will let this be G2G topic for us. We have to fulfill our mandate and stay in our lane. Uh, from our point, uh, we are in food, so that means it's a humanitarian product. So we, we always respect what are the restrictions that each country puts on trading with uh, other countries. That's why uh, the policy that we had on being uh, in different areas, uh, especially in South America, to produce uh, food, that creates a trust from our final customer, regardless right. they are in China, United States, in Taiwan, or whatever. I want to talk about practical issues here because we can talk about the philosophies, but let's face it, you know, they will be decided by people in, a, in, a, in different places, in different ways. But taking your freight forwarding, we have at the moment, regrettably, two hot wars at the moment, and that has real practical difficulties in terms of putting things on ships and sending them. It either has to go longer one way, longer the other, and that creates greater costs. How difficult is that for you? No, I think it's, it's not just the wars. It's the pandemics, it's the climate, all of this. It's, it's quite difficult. It's not Panama Canal? Yes, I mean, if you look at the chokehold of the Pan Panama Canal on the back of the climate change, if you look at what's taking place at the Red Sea and the Panama Canal, they've actually estimated it's going to cost $1.25 trillion because of what's going on, for, because of two reasons. One is the increase in prices when it comes to freight, over 230%, and it's also taking 9% longer to deliver the goods wherever the destination is meant to be. Can I, can I turn this in sort of a risk and a challenge? Can I turn this into opportunity? If you're going to solve the, whatever the existing challenges are, you have to be resilient by rethinking your supply chain end to end. Ongoing challenges is an example that this may happen again somewhere else. So you solve for resilience in a way that's saying, okay, this is an issue that 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 likely to happen. Do we do we know that in the next 10 years, next pandemic won't happen? We don't. But why don't we re if we are retooling supply chain, why not retool it in a way that really make us resilient? And and so instead of thinking of this as a challenge, look at this, look at that, I would oh. say, hang on, we are living in a more uncertain world, it's a new reality, and we really gotta go solve for this new focus that we are building on, on world class. And Saudi Arabia is ready to welcome our partners to, to achieve resilience and achieve benefits. Yeah, but you're solving the last set of problems, in a sense, aren't you? Inevitably, it's an ex post facto re, um, realignment of supply chain. So you've looked at, you've looked at pandemic, You've looked at increased costs of Panama Canal, which is likely to continue because it's a climate. It's not going to be solved the immediacy of the end of, say, for example, the Middle East uh, conflict where the Red Sea becomes safe again. So you've retooled the supply chain to accommodate that. But that was the, the last set of problems. Now let me ask you, what are the next set of problems that need to be? How can you diversify for all... Diversification for all seasons, if you will. Yeah, known knowns and known unknowns and unknown unknowns. Like there's many ways we can look at this. But what I would say, what is essential is you need to have a culture of agility, you need to have digitization, and you need to really put all of this in, call it a supply chain operating system that help you manage all these constraints you have to put on. It is not possible to really solve for all permutation combination unless you have a digital tool to help you manage that. I think, so from my perspective, I agree. And I think the critical thing is you're not gonna take complexity out of the system. Right. You're not gonna take away disruption. You're not gonna take away geopolitics. This is it's not gonna happen, but there are two critical things that everyone needs to do, especially from the supply chain side and, and, and the manufacturing and you know all the different sectors. 
what, the first thing is invest in technology and make sure your workforce have the capability to leverage it and adopt it to apply it. That's a critical thing. That is a huge deterrent to future disasters and to drive agility. And the other thing is public-private partnerships. In order to succeed, companies have to work closely with the public sector to understand policy, to understand the next move, and also to hear back from companies as to how, agility, how agile they need to be. I think, Richard, you put it very well that we have to take from here to there. So understanding the chain and having information, both from the source and from the destination, they are vital because you need contingency plans here in the middle. Uh, ports will not work. Countries will have political issues. So having contingency plans for each of them. So the exercise of having uh, the risk management tools in place, using or not using AI, using the experience, using uh, the main vocation of the country is absolutely vital. So what's interesting about that is we've basically got two policy as a CEO and as a fraud and yourself, you have two things that you have to do. You have to do the big, expensive, macro, we're going to need factories in more trusted places. We're going to need to get things where we know we can get them. That's long term, 10 year projects, whatever. But what you've just said and what you've said is, is fascinating because you're basically saying, this is the policy, whatever happens. Yep. The ability to be agile, as, the, as, your name, <laughs> as your name suggests. Is it your experience, and then I'm going to come to you to ask how you do it. Is it your experience that most companies are or are not prepared for the crisis de jour? They're not prepared, in simple terms. If you look quite simply, look at a few things. Today... Look, Speak up, please. You have... Look, look at two things today. 17% of companies today only have real-time visibility, real-time for their goods. The other 70, 80% have visibility within a one-week delay, and that is a critical issue. That's one piece. The other piece is, look at, during the pandemic, how many times the word supply chain showed up in analyst calls. That same group of people, when you talk to them, only a quarter of them have supply chain being discussed at the board level. So that is a real problem. What's your biggest, biggest thing that you move? What fruit, vegetable, what is it? Meat, beef. Beef? Yes. Right. How do, you, to take exactly what you've just said, when you sit down and you look at the infrastructure, what decisions are you making now? It's how to, trans, how to uh, take uh, from the source to the final destination. And there are different ways in terms, not only on the logistics, but also in terms of uh, geographies where you produce. The markets are much uh, more volatile. So cope with uh, volatility and transforming volatility into an opportunity, it's uh, the key factor. And the way of doing that is by information, by geographic diversification, and by understanding the whole chain. Do you spend a lot of time on this? A lot. And which is the product that gives you the most trouble? Well, depending on the time. Uh, infrastructure is one of them. Uh, climate uh, changes. Oh, no, I thought uh, I was hoping you were going to say bananas or blueberries. So I would like to add something to this. Yeah. So in the past, this approach towards supply chain was don't touch if it isn't broken. Leave it alone. <laughs> okay? Yeah. Then things change and now 6 to 10% of cost extra being spent because of these disruptions, these new realities, and so on and so forth. I would say that we are slowly getting there, at least the world-class companies are getting there who we partner with, but if you say, have we solved for all permutation and combination of what may happen? Have we solved for all companies? Have we all solved for all geographies? Answer is no. But that's why we're going to meet up after this session and we'll solve it for them. <laughs> <laughs> I think we just heard a bit of business done there. <laughs> Do I get a commission? I think yeah. I, I, I take my... No, but this is an opportunity. But notice he doesn't say yes. <laughs> but I'm doing is, the work here. This is an opportunity. I am oh. saying this is the point. She's looking at it as an opportunity. I'm looking at it as an opportunity. He's looking at an opportunity. You got to accept... You, it, the acceptance of problem is 50% of problem solved. That's the first issue. So it is a problem. Yes, we acknowledge it. Now we are on to solving it, and new changes will come. 
I think each of the industries, they were very right. isolated. I think what we are doing here... You're taking learning, over the panel, yeah? <laughs> uh, ...is learning with each other. There are different experiences that can be replicated. <laughs> come back, Richard. Come. come on, come back. We're out of time. Listen, just make sure I get my Christmas presents on time. You make sure I get my computer on time, and you make sure I get my blueberries on time. <laughs> okay. If all three of you manage to do that, I'll be happy. I'll panel. Great. Thank you.